okay uh hey students welcome to the second session on the topic labor relations the topic of second session is collective bargaining samuhika keval kirima in singhala also there are several alternative terms in singhala samuhika katikava samuhika kevale saha samuhika hetu collective bargaining so these are the objectives or learning outcomes are uh, expected as far as this session is concerned define what collective bargaining means know some subject matters of collective bargaining identify three types of collective bargaining structures and fourth objective fourth learning outcome no collective bargaining and understand how to do it from the point of management from the point of management not from the point of trade union from the point of management and then fifth objective to get a practical oriented understanding by doing a case study collective bargaining so uh, go to the writing given by professor tripathi an indian professor there are three approaches to labor management negotiations unilateral bipartite and tripartite unilateral you know uh, unilateral means uh, ek in singular you know ek so there is so there is one party there is one party uh so on the unilateral one party means the employer or the owner or the top management of the organization makes all the decisions affecting uh employees all the decisions uh relating to employment of employees employment of employees bipartite so there are two parties there are two parties uh trade union and the management of the organization or the owner so then trade union and the uh, employer will get together and then determine decide terms and conditions of employment so that is under bipartite tripartite then the government involvement is there there are three parties tripartite so okay let, let me read this in the unilateral approach the employer alone decides the terms and conditions of employment for his so her workers assuming that he knows what is best for them he knows what is best for them then in the bipartite approach the employer negotiates with his workers this is also known as collective bargaining so workers are represented by the trade union so therefore here there is collective unionized labor so in the tripartite approach besides the two main parties the third party generally the government the state uh, also participates in the negotiations in the negotiations so in the in indian case the state but here the in sri lankan case the government participates in the negotiations so conciliation arbitration adjudication wage boards etc are examples of tripartitism tripartitism so therefore uh, i am not going to talk about conciliation arbitration adjudication etc that is beyond the objectives of this session uh, but this one the bipartite approach this one we have to uh, learn you are supposed to learn and now i am uh, dealing with that <clears throat> right so then uh, thus the bipartite approach to labor management negotiation is collective bargaining collective bargaining right definition of collective bargaining after successful unionization of workers 
that has been accepted by the employer, collective bargaining will have to be done. So that means the collective bargaining has to be done after successful unionization of workers. But this unionization has to be accepted by the employer for collective bargaining purpose. So without then without unionization, there is no need of doing collective bargaining. Collective bargaining. So therefore, please understand that collective bargaining happens in an organization where at least there is one trade union representing uh, employees, representing employees, usually non-managerial employees. Collective bargaining refers to a process in which employers' representatives and workers' representatives, employees, employers, sorry, harm putun, harm putun, harm putagi, metang, seva yojikyagi, nyojikya. Employers, representatives, they are managers, and then worker representatives, that is trade union, meet, discuss, and attempt to negotiate about working conditions and terms of employment. Working conditions and terms of employment. The trade union, yes, the term collective uh, is used to the reason that the workers and the employer act as a group, act as a group rather than individuals working separately. So uh, I think you can remember uh, under the first session, I distinguish between two terms, personal relations and labor relations. Uh, when, you know, when considering personal relations, individual interactions happen, but when we consider uh, labor relations, collective interactions happen. Hence, collective bargaining involves group bargaining, but not individual bargaining. Right. The term bargaining is used because evolving an agreement involves the use of method of negotiation. So there is negotiation, there is negotiation. So that includes communicating proposals, then counter proposals, then discussion, compromise for mutual gain. Mutual gain, anyonya pati labe, anyonya labe sandha, sapatya, compromise. Compromise for mutual gain rather than confrontation. Rather than confrontation. What is the objective of collective bargaining? What is the objective of collective bargaining? It is to reach an agreement between the trade union and the manager. For what? In order to enhance level of well-being of the workers, but not only to enhance level of well-being of the workers, but also to, but also to enhance the level of success of the organization. To improve the level of success of the organization by ensuring smooth function. Because the trade union and the management should work together. Collaboratively, they should work. If they don't work collaboratively, then there is no industrial peace instead of industrial peace what we have is industrial unrest there are, there are strikes picketings overtime bans so industrial actions industrial actions which definitely hinder the productivity of the organization effectiveness of the organization efficiency of the organization therefore we do need smooth functioning in order to achieve goals of the organization goals of the organization so therefore the purpose of or the objective of collective bargaining is to reach an agreement between the trade union and the management the agreement that comes out between the two parties with regard to various matters is called collective agreement samohika gyusum in Singapore. Of course, it is a formal document, 
that has to be signed by the both parties, the two parties. You know, so it, you know, that it states in detail all the terms and conditions of their employment. Of course, uh, those terms and conditions, the both parties have decided on. So therefore, they have to adhere to once uh, deciding. They have to follow. You know, they have to follow. They cannot uh, violate. They cannot violate. So the collective agreement is a formal document. Indeed, it is going to be a legal document when the Labor Commissioner, Commissioner General, agrees with that. Right. Usually, <clears throat> you should understand that collective bargaining is a popular practice, popular event in the developed countries like United Kingdom, USA, Germany, etc. But in Sri Lanka, this is not a popular event. This is not a popular event. But of course, in Sri Lanka also, uh, in several organizations, collective bargaining has happened. Collective bargaining has happened. What are the subject matters of collective bargaining? Next, subject matters. What are the things you know which usually come under collective bargaining? So under collective bargaining, about what things the union and the management are going to talk, going to discuss, and then going to agree. The subject matter of collective bargaining is very wide, very wide. It covers a variety of issues affecting employment relationship between the workers and the management. Between the workers and management. So it mentioned briefly almost all the things relating to the employment. You know, that is used, you know, almost all the things uh, which are, you know, which are leading to enhance the well-being of the workers, workers' advancement and then smooth functioning uh, of the business. Uh, all these things come under subject matter of collective bargaining. So specifically, look at these things. Specific items, subject matters, coming under collective bargaining. Now you can see. Recognition of trade union and union or union. So this is a must. Once the trade union was formed, then that has to be accepted by the uh, management. Otherwise, there is no collective bargaining. And wages and salaries, allowances, incentives and privileges for employees, incentives, you know, they, these, are, these are paid uh, to improve productivity beyond the normal level of uh, production. And welfare facilities such as, you know, health facilities, recreational facilities, transport facilities, educational facilities, right, and hours of working, the leave and festival holidays, bonuses and profit sharing, layoff, transfers and promotions, terminations, resignations, retirements, and employee provident funds and pension payments, pension payments, the discipline, employee health and safety, trainings, complete settlement, complete you know, handling, uh, grievance, you know, conflict, you know, when, when there is a conflict. So if a conflict happens between the trade union and management, then how to settle it? You know, how to settle it? Uh, that has to be uh, discussed and then for which there must be an agreement between the trade union and the management. That's why this is also coming under uh, subject matters of collective agreement. Then grievance handling and other, you know, general terms and conditions of employment. Like, you know, starting time of the work, ending time of the work, then how many breaks per day given to workers, then the duration of each break, then the timing of each break, so like, you know, so other working conditions, anything, you know, anything which is important, 
which leads to smooth functioning of the organization, which leads to uh, improve the well-being of the employees. Right. So you can see here the Indian Institute of Personal Management, Calcutta, suggests the following as a subject matter of collective bargaining. The rights and responsibilities of the management. This is a very important thing. Rights and responsibilities of the management and also rights and responsibilities of the trade union. Right. Then types of collective bargaining structures. Types of collective bargaining structures. Basically, there are three types. First one, unitary bargaining. Ekiya kapikal. Samohika kapikal. Eki. So here one trade union and one employer participate in the collective bargaining. One trade union and one employer. So lowest degree of complexity. So we can see. And also within a, a shorter time, relatively, it is possible to uh, get the agreement or reach the agreement, that is the collective agreement. This type of bargaining takes place at the organizational level, at the organizational level. Okay, so then the second one, multi-union bargaining. So that means uh, at least there are two unions. Normally in a large company, uh, there are several trade unions. There are several trade unions, countries like Sri Lanka. There is a union multiplicity. So normally in Sri Lanka, almost all the trade unions are having a linkage with uh, various political parties. In a country like Sri Lanka, there are several, or if not many, so in fact many really, many political parties, then there can be, you know, many uh, trade unions, trade unions. So I know uh, in some companies, there are more than 10 trade unions, 10 trade unions. So they are, therefore, this is structure takes place between one employer and two or more trade unions. So this is the usual practice in an organization where there are several trade unions within the same plant or at the different plants. Relatively, the degree of complexity is higher, you know, compared with this one. Unitary bargaining, of course, the degree of complexity is higher because several trade unions are there. And it will take a relatively longer time for the settlement, you know, to come, uh, to, come to an agreement with one trade union it's not that difficult. You know, coming or getting an agreement with several trade unions compared with that. Because they have, you know, different political ideologies, different objectives, then difficult to come, you know, to an agreement. Among the trade unions, you know, which have uh, different political objectives, different Yes, agendas and multiple bargaining. This is structure involves several employers as an employer's federation. And as an employer's federation, and then several trade unions as a union association. Urutiya Samiti Sangvidane. A union association. You know, several unions can get together and then start one big association. Uh, here the several employers can get together and then start an organization on behalf of them. Uh, that is called federation, employers federation. Now, relatively, the degree of complexity is highest as far as these uh, three types of bargaining structures are concerned. The, the, the degree of complexity is highest you know, in case of multiple bargaining. So because it, it has you know, associations, 
uh, which uh, represents uh, several trade unions, at least one association that represents several trade unions, and at least one employer uh, federation that represents several employers, several organizations. So it will take a relatively longest time for the settlement as many parties are involved. So this type of bargaining usually takes place at the industry level. Industry level, also it may take place at the regional level and the national level as well. Okay, so therefore collective bargaining can happen at the organization level, at the industry level, at the regional level, and at the national level. Right, next, the importance of collective bargaining the importance of collective bargaining. So collective bargaining gives benefits to workers, managers, employers, trade unions, government and general people in the society. Why? You know, as it is a good method of solving problems between labor and management. So when there are strikes, when there are picketings, when there are industrial conflicts between labor, that is organized labor and management. So then it's very difficult to you know, uh, achieve the expected productivity. When in, uh, in, so, in some cases, the demand, there will be a serious problem for the demand of the product or the service. Then the general people also, they are also going to be hurt. So remember that, you know, so then uh, if there are, you know, uh, if there is no good labor management relationship, then general people get suffered. The government gets suffered negatively, not positively. So therefore collective bargaining, you know, serves almost all the parties in the society, workers, managers, employers, trade unions, the government and the general people. If LMR becomes favorable, all concerned get benefited. So it's a system based on bipartite agreements. And it will be, yes, possible for unions and management to settle their problems relating to employment. Without participation of what? Without participation of outside, outside parties or outsiders, such as government or its agents, such as government or its agents. So normally, you know, look at this one, you know, this statement, Professor Singh and others, collective bargaining helps to promote cooperation and mutual understanding between workers and the management, between the workers and the management. It provides a framework for desiring the terms and conditions of employment without resource to strikes and lockouts and without the intervention of outsiders. So it is good, you know, to settle problems between the management and the trade union within the organization without giving problems to outsiders outsiders. Right. Then due to collective bargaining, both management and unions within an organization will have the opportunity of discussing about various issues of employment and then the opportunity of reaching a collective agreement. So this agreement will result in generating certainty and smooth function of LMR, labor management relationship within the organization. Certainty and also smooth function. Also generally a collective agreement specifies grievance and dispute settlement proceeding. If there is a strike then how to settle it? From the point of employees, there are advantages. What are they? Building trust among the workers about the management. 
developing responsibility and self-respect among the workers. Because there's a chance for workers to participate, to discuss, to involve, deciding various things, you know, which affect their lives. Their lives. So therefore, you know, because of that opportunity, they have self-respect. Also, of course, there is responsibility for them also. On the part of workers also, there is a responsibility. An increase in the strength of the workers. Then strengthening the trade union movement. And restricting management arbitrary and unfair decision. Affecting the workers. Affecting the workers. So then, you know, if there is no trade union, then there is no collective bargaining. Then the top managers can make their own decisions, which may involve exploiting the you know, labor, exploiting the labor, unfair treatments to certain employees. Uh, those things, you know, usually can be prevented if there is good collective bargaining. Then promoting, uh, there are advantages from the point of the employer. What are they? Promoting proper communication between the workers and the management. And assisting to settle various disputes. Building a certain discipline among the workers. Because there are terms and conditions that agree, which are in the collective agreement, to which all the relevant employees uh, should adhere. So then, you know, so there is certain discipline. There is certain discipline among the workers. Every day or every month, they can't make demands when there is a collective agreement. They have to follow the terms and conditions of the collective agreement. Usually, the duration of collective agreement is three years. So, at least, you know, within three years, there is a certain discipline. There is certainty among the workers or related to the workers' behaviors, trade union behaviors. Then promoting better HR, you know, that is another, another advantage. Having collective bargaining will enhance the quality of HR, quality of HR, because the communication will get improved, uh, dispute settlement will get improved, grievance handling will get improved, disciplinary management will get improved. So therefore, all these things will contribute to um, make HRM better. In process of now, the process of collective bargaining. Okay, uh, next. Uh, process of collective bargaining. Collective bargaining is a process. So if it is a process, this, it must have certain steps. Certain steps, certain stages, you know, certain stages, Right, so now I am going to show you a figure that uh, gives the collective bargaining process from the point of management, from the point of management. So remember, you know, this model is an expansion of the original model developed by Professor Werther and Professor Davis. So I adjusted, modified, so as to suit the Sri Lankan environment, Sri Lankan environment. That model is a very good model. That's why I uh, decided to use it and then expand it. Okay, so, so it is not intended that hmm, every organization should follow exactly and compulsorily stages and steps of the model. So I will show you three stages and then several steps of the model, of the model. Okay, if you ask this question, you know, so assume uh, you are the responsible manager who is supposed to have a collective agreement with the trade union. Uh, then you have a big challenge, how to do collective bargaining. You have a big problem, how to do collective bargaining successfully with the trade union. With the trade union. So the, the process of collective bargaining is, an, is a systematic attempt to give a good answer for that question. How to do collective bargaining. 
Okay, look at this figure. A model of collective bargaining process. The first stage is preparatory stage. Sudan Angbimi Adir. Preparatory stage. So under preparatory stage, there are certain steps. Indeed, there are seven steps. There are seven steps. You can see, starting with assembling the bargaining team, assemble the bargaining team, then monitor the, the environment, and then the last step, government agent participation. Then the second stage, negotiation stage. Gives a genie the negotiation stage. So that has uh, four steps discussion, reach an agreement, approve the agreement, and legalization. Legalization. Then the third stage, that is administration stage. Paripalan Adir. Administration uh, stage. So that has uh, three steps. Communication of the agreement, adjustment, ensure union and management compliance. Okay, so you can see then, the model, collective bargaining model. Three stages, preparatory stage, negotiation stage, and administration stage. All together, how many steps? Seven plus uh, four, then 11, right. 11 plus three, then 14. So there are all together 14 steps. 14 steps. So remember this a model is from the point of the management. What is that from the point of the management? How to do collective bargaining on the part of the management. So therefore, this is a useful model for the manager or the human resource manager to do collective bargaining with the trade union successfully. Successfully. Okay, now uh, let me <coughs> Uh, describe each step. The first one, under the first stage, that is preparatory stage, assemble the bargaining team. So preparation of preparatory stage, Sudanang Vimi Adir. Sudanang Vimi Adir. So here the, the management has to has to get ready for the collective bargaining. The management has to get the uh, get ready for the collective bargaining. That's why preparation, preparation. So in fact, planning for a uh, collective bargaining. So under preparation, the the management has to deal with planning, planning. Right. The first one assemble the bargaining team in singular. Keval kirime kandayma tirne karando. The first, it should be decided that who or what management representatives on behalf of the management participate in collective bargaining with the trade union. Who is going to discuss with the trade union on the part of the manager? That has to be decided. Generally, the human resource manager takes the leadership of the team. Takes the leadership of the team because human resource manager is the manager who has a very good understanding about trade union matters, HR matter. Ideally, the human resource manager should be, you know, should be a highly competent person about HR matters, including trade union matters, labor laws, freedom and labor laws. So therefore, the generally, the human resource manager takes the leadership of the team. In addition to human resource manager, 
several managers can be appointed to work uh, yes, under this team. Financial specialists will usually uh, subject matters of collective bargaining involve finance, money. If not all the subject matters, but several subject matters involve finance. You know, very important subject matter under collective bargaining is wages and salaries. Deciding wages and salaries, wage and salary increments, welfare facilities, welfare insurance schemes such as, you know, welfare facilities such as insurance schemes, transport schemes, educational schemes, so which you know involve finance money so therefore a financial specialist or finance manager then the legal specialist you know who has a good understanding about various labor laws contracts law then one or two line managers you know, line managers you know who have a well understanding of business matters the works of the business, usually line managers have, like production manager, marketing manager, marketing manager, or his or her representative. Okay, right. Then the second step of the first stage, monitor the environment. Parisara, yeah, Parikshakini. What is this? Monitoring the environment means that the bargaining team checks internal and external environment so that hints, clues about likely union demand. Likely union demands. What is this? In Singhala, Urkiya Samiti Visin, Idiripatkalaki, Illi, 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 Pilibanda, Kodua. Hints, clues about likely union demands for the bargaining are obtained. Because, you know, uh, <coughs> it is essential for the uh, bargaining team to know likely union demand. At the bargaining table, in reality, you know, what will be the demand presented by the trade union. If the bargaining team can understand these demands, and then the bargaining team will be able to, you know, propose good solutions, right solutions for the benefits of the entire organization. You know, trade unions, they may have political objectives. They may, you know, uh, present unfair decisions, unfair demands, not decisions. Yes, their own decisions, yes. They may not be uh, agreed by the management, but unfair decisions, unfair demands, they may present. Which may, which may, you know, destroy the smooth functioning, functioning of the organization, the finance of the organization. Some demands, you know, the organization may not be able to afford, may not be able to afford. Right. So the, uh, so that's why, you know, so the monitor the environment in order to uh, know likely union demands. Right union demands. Then several sources. What are the sources, you know, that are available for the use of the bargaining team for the purpose of finding clues or the hints? Look at here. So you can find several sources. Promises given by the trade union leaders at the time of unionization. For example, you know, increasing salaries by 25%. Uh, that may be a promise. Then he's starting, a, you know, uh, asking for a health insurance. Uh, that may be a promise. That may be an example of a promise given by the union leaders. So these promises are going to, you know, are going to the table when actually the collective bargaining happens. Okay, so the promises will become uh, likely union demands. Then the demands not won at the last bargaining, if the union is one that has already established. 
assume uh, at the last bargaining session, the trade union presented uh, 10 demands, but only seven demands were made. Other three are remaining. Then most likely, these remaining three demands will come to this time. This time. For example, assume uh, union, you know, uh, union wanted to get a scholarship program for children of uh, workers. But the management did not accept that and turned down, owing to some reasonable reasons, including uh, lack of uh, finance. Now, this time, that demand most likely comes to the bargaining table. The demands won or been presented currently by trade unions in other organizations, other competitive organizations in the industry. In the industry, assume the industry is uh, printing industry, printing industry. Then recently, assume one trade union in a competitive organization, competitive organization, could win several uh, demands, several demands, several demands, including a special uh, what the special recreational uh, facility. Recreational facility, you know, what is what is recreational? Normally, the so, you know, pursuit of patients, enjoyment facilities. Assume three three uh, three uh, trips per year. So the again, we know the we know the charge trips. Three trips per year. Assume that uh, that trade union of the competitive organization could win. Uh, then our trade union also uh, assume they our trade union was able to know about this winning and then uh, our trade union may take that as a lesson and then uh, may present the same demand and then checking of national general inflation rate cost of living etc so now it's more likely that the trade union presents a demand for wage increases because cost of living is high. Of course, when there's a, a severe national general inflation, you now when a severe national general inflation exists, most likely there will be a demand coming from the trade union to increase salaries, salaries. So therefore, you know, we can check I mean, the bargaining team, we means the bargaining team, bargaining team can check the, the level of inflation, the nature of the cost of living, the changes relating to cost of living. Okay, so the, if there is a genuine significant increase of cost of living, most likely the trade union will have a grievance on that will have a demand for that. Then workers' grievances expressed and unexpressed. The news of grapevine, you know, informal communication. Talking to several workers informal. The bargaining team can do that. The human resource manager. Usually human resource manager is a manager who is having good relationship, at least with certain employees. Ideally with all employees, but at least with certain employees, practically. Then by talking to such, you know, uh, friendly employees, it may be possible for the human resource manager to, uh, you know, uh, know likely union demands. Then union uh, bulletins, if they are union bulletins, you know, small papers, newspapers, you know, which contain information about various functions of the trade union, uh, the progress, you know, progressive activities, ongoing activities of the trade union. Okay, so therefore these are the sources which are available for the use of the bargaining team in order to get uh, clues, find clues or so, uh, hints, signals, about the likely union demand. 
So in some cases, you know, in some cases, the top management can directly ask for giving a list of demands, list of uh, union demands. If you look at, you know, this one, this is skill builder. Polybags Limited is a manufacturing firm engaged in production and marketing of different types of bags used for packing sugar, fertilizer, salt, onions, and potatoes. The firm is a unionized firm and the union is an enterprise union started one and a half years ago. For the first time, the union forwarded following list of demands to the manager. So the management right so what are the demands look at this one so this is skill builder was developed based on an actual scenario so therefore these were you know actual examples of union demands not hypothetical to increase wages by you know, many years ago you know not, not now many years ago so to increase wages by five thousand for all workers, irrespective of uh, categories, unskilled workers, semi-skilled workers, and skilled workers. Then to pay uh, 20 rupees for each unit of increase of the cost of living index. Then to increase attendance allowance up to uh, 2,500 rupees and allow all workers to get it without cutting then to double the incentive on the basis of daily production for workers. Then to pay food allowance according to the prices in the canteen. So likewise, you know, even to give a break first with tea without any charge. You know, so these were uh, some examples of union demands. So therefore, you know, uh, the, the, the company, uh, the top management of the company can ask for a list of union demands. Then of course, uh, easy, no need to, you know, put an extra effort to find out uh, clues and hints about the likely union demands. If the management can, the bargaining team can get the list of demands, the actual demands of the trade union, then it is easy for the bargaining team to get ready to deal with the demands. Deal with the demands. Okay, now uh, next step. Third step of the uh, first stage preparatory stage. What is the third step? Determine offers. Prati Ojana. Eva Pirinami Pirinakiri. You know? What to be done in, the, in this step is this to decide on management's counter proposals. Prati Ojana. What management can give for estimated likely union demands? Okay, so I assume this, you know, the team expects. A demand, if the team expects a demand of wage increase about 25%, then it will have to determine whether this 25% can be paid or not. Then if paid, or whether an increase can be paid. Forget about first, 25%. The percentage comes next, but before that, you know, whether an increase of wage can be paid or not, that has to be decided. So assume that the, the management can pay, right? Management can give a wage increase. And then how much? 25% or 20% or 15% or 10% likewise. And that has to be decided next. So therefore, you know, counter proposals for the likely union demands, estimated or expected or even given directly by the trade union. So the counter is, uh, proposes represent management plans, management plans for the collective bargaining. Management plans. 
So again, let me go to this uh, list. Management plan. Pillai. Okay, so this is this is the list of uh, trade union demands. Then for each demand, there must be a solution from the management, from the bargaining team. Uh, that solution is the counter proportion. Take this one to give a breakfast with tea without uh, any charge. Then what is the answer for this demand? Now what is the response for this demand? Is it possible to give a breakfast with tea without any charge? Assume it is possible. Uh, then how? Oh no, it's not possible. Assume it's not possible. Uh, then the you know counter proposal maybe. Uh, to give you know to to charge to charge uh, fifty percent of the uh, price for the breakfast for the breakfast. Uh, this may be the counter proposal to charge fifty percent full free not possible. 50 percent and then trade union, trade union may agree with this or may not agree maybe after negotiation maybe it may come to 40 percent that is possible that is possible or even 60 percent if the trade union if the management is more powerful okay right uh, Reach and right. Yeah, yeah. It done mean of us. And then fourth step. Determine time, place, and rounds. Round water, water, rounds. When the collective bargaining should be conducted actually. When when? When the should the management Conduct collective bargaining actually. What is the date? And what time? And where you know, it is held? Those things you know will have to be uh, decided. So I assume there are many you know demands involved. Uh, then uh, you know conducting or uh, having the discussion for one time may not be sufficient. You know, many demands may require. Uh, having uh, two rounds, even three rounds. Okay, then how many rounds? What a key up can all? Pratham vate munavadagani sakachavad. Devini vate munavadagani. So likewise. So at a time when there are many matters to be discussed and negotiated, holding collective bargaining sessions at several rounds will have to be done. Okay, then uh, next step, 1.5, secure top management approval. Agra Kalamana Kari Kri Anumati Labagani. Because the bargaining team prepares counter proposal. And the top management doesn't know about them. Therefore, the having prepared bar, having prepared counter proposals for likely union demands or the union demands which were directly presented. Uh, then these uh, uh, proposals, you know, will have to be forwarded to the top management to examine, so that the top management can give uh, its, you know, consent. If the if the top management doesn't like with a certain proposal, then the top management, you know, can ask the bargaining team to prepare another plan, an alternative plan, right, then for 1.6, check union actions, check union actions, what is this, so assume, you know, certain demands the management doesn't like to me. Certain demands the management doesn't like to me. For example, okay. 
let's take this list so, right uh, to increase that in the salam so I assume you know the okay this one to increase attendance allowance up to uh, 2500 so the management doesn't like to you know, allow all workers to get it without cutting all workers to get it without cutting so assume that the union demand is this it doesn't matter whether the employee you know uh, gives the full attendance or not that employee has to be paid with the attendance allowance assume that is the demand you know, with which the management doesn't like to agree management doesn't like to agree at all assume, with the demand with the demand okay, then uh, then assume there are other demands also certain demands assume there are five demands the management doesn't like to agree with uh, then yeah, you know the, the, if the management doesn't like to agree with them then the management should check whether you know the union can launch a strike because of not meeting not agreeing with uh, such demands you know, what is the what is the strength of the trade union is it possible for the uh, you know the trade union to start a strike to influence you know its members and then you know gets the uh, higher participation is it possible for the trade union to get the higher participation of its members for 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 the strike? So, okay. So the manage. So assume the severe, assume the support to the trade union is very high. The support of the members of the trade union is very high. Now then it is more likely that the strike can happen. The strike can happen then the management should get prepared in advance to face, face uh, that is fact so sound preparedness will strengthen the power of the management at the bargaining table so then what is the objective of preparedness the objective of preparedness for strike in advance is to minimize possible loss to the organization possible Lost to the organization. Okay, so then uh, assume you know if if there are workers who are not members of the union, so it may be possible to utilize them to work continuously to meet customer demands at least to a certain extent. So you know, assume uh, next month you know they are you know. There will be the strike, as you. Then within this month, assume there are another, uh, there, there are two weeks yet to finish the this month. Uh, within these two weeks, the management can have, you know, so a special plan to get the production done. Get the production done. Then that is another preparation, another preparation. You know, to get the production done through the uh, employees who are not members of the strike, uh, that is another plan. That is another plan. Okay, then uh, 1.7. Government agent participation. Government agent uh, participation. Raji Niyojita Sahabhagi. So it needs to decide whether participation of the government agent. Who is this government agent here? Labor Commission. Or his so her representative or Labor General if there is now. So in the forthcoming collective bargain, is needed or not? So it needs to decide whether the participation of the government agent in the forthcoming collective bargaining in the future forthcoming collective bargaining is needed or not and if needed it is possible to get participation of the commission or his or her representative now then you know necessary arrangements will have to be made to contact the 
labor commissioner, and then you know, get the possible days. I mean, the, you know, then uh, you know, fix fix a date which is convenient to the labor commissioner to participate. To participate. But this, you know, this this is not compulsory. You know, to get the government uh, agent participation is not a compulsory thing. But if there is a need of inviting the commission, eh, genuine need, ah, then usually the the organization decides to get the bargaining team decides to get the government agent participation. So read this one, you know. A need of inviting the commissioner may arise if the organization does the bargaining for the first time. Because the, the, the bargaining team doesn't have the experience, previous experience. Then if union officials are highly politically motivated or aggressive, then there is a need of inviting the commissioner. Also, if more recognition to the collective agreement is sought, then it is good to invite the government agent. Right. Now, the negotiation stage. Negotiation stage. Right. After the performance of the first stage, that is the preparation, preparatory stage. Now, you know, at the second stage, uh, that is negotiation. This is where the actual negotiation happens. This is the stage where collective bargaining between the trade union and the management occurs actually. So achieving a collective agreement after careful discussions happens in this stage, in action, in this stage. Right. This stage has uh, four steps to be followed, sequence it. In the first step of the second a stage uh, that is discussion. Sakacha hearing. Sakacha hearing. Okay, of course, this has to be done as planned under the first stage. The discussion should be made separately with regard to each matter. If there are 10 matters, then of course, 10 discussions, specific discussions. The management should approach to the discussions with. Of course, cordial mind, not with rage, fury, you know, hostility, hostility, even cordial mind. Face to face bargaining commences, and the management should be able to handle this face to face bargaining by working systematically and intelligently. Because the purpose of collective bargaining is to make an agreement that is going to be bound, you know, make an agreement uh, that will regulate the behavior of the trade union and also the behavior of the management, at least for a period of uh, three years. Three years. So therefore, you know, the, this, the cordial mind without the intention of retaliation with rage, fury, simple the anger, the discussion should not be done. Okay, uh, <clears throat> right. Emotional intelligence, you know, bhavatmaka buddhi. That's very important here. In addition to cognitive intelligence. Right. Uh, reach an agreement. Second step of the second stage. Reach an uh, agreement. Here both parties, you know, will come to an agreement having discussed in detail. And also in educated way with regard to the relevant matters. This agreement needs to be shown in writing, written, document is needed. Of course, document is written, so therefore written agreement is needed. 
This written agreement is called collective agreement, which specifies you know, all the relevant policies, procedures, terms and conditions, uh, responsibilities and you know, uh, rights of the each party. So that's the framework which governs behavior of the trade union, the management, until such time is specified in the agreement, so usually three years. Okay, the third step of the second uh, stage, approve the agreement. Because, you know, this uh, discussion, agreeing, uh, those things happen between the trade union and the bargaining chain, not with the top management of the organization. Usually top management doesn't participate. The top manager doesn't part, participate in the discussion. So therefore, it is important, it is essential. Now, it is essential that the, the agreement is presented to the top manager to get its consent, approval. Okay, so then my, my, my question then, you know, let me ask one question. Why uh, is it not good to uh, invite the top manager of the organization to participate? To participate in the uh, bargaining table, in the bargaining. Why? That's an important question. That's an important uh, question. So one reason is normally the top manager is not aware about the grassroots level matters. Also the top manager is not aware about, you know, uh, the, the art and science of collective bargaining. Collective bargaining. There's a huge art and science of collective bargaining. So the, to discuss details of collective bargaining is beyond the objectives of this session. Such things are for uh, students who specialize in human resource management. You know, there are different types of bargaining, distributive bargaining, uh, integrative bargaining, then there are various techniques, you know, coming under bargaining. Tactics, techniques, principles, there are. Okay, so, so therefore one reason, you know, the top manager, top manager is not aware about grassroots level matters, you know, down matters. The top manager is very busy with the strategic planning, strategic matters. And also, you know, so I assume uh, there's a very big demand, you know, not expected by the bargaining team, came to the bar bargaining table, unexpected demand. Then the bargaining team, you know, uh, didn't prepare and also bargaining team is not having a counter proposal for that unexpected demand. So therefore, the bargaining team needs a time to study, time to discuss, and also to get the, uh, you know, uh, yes, time, you know, the bargaining team needs to have a sufficient time to study that matter. Then there's a need of postponing uh, the discussion about that unexpected demand, adjourning, postponing. Uh, then, as an excuse, you know, the, the bargaining team can tell, you know, we want to discuss with the top manager. Top manager is not with us now. So, therefore, you know, uh, to discuss about this matter has to be postponed. Has to be postponed for the next uh, round, for the next round. Did you understand what I say? David Mo, can Urti Samitiya, Anapek Shita. Uh, 
සඳහන් කරන්න පුළුවන් අග්‍ර කළමනාකරණයේ සහභාගී වෙන්න අපිත් එක්ක අපිට අනිවාර්යයෙන්ම අග්‍ර කළමනාකරණයේ එක සාකච්ඡා කරන්න ඕන අග්‍ර කළමනාකරණයේ අදාස ගන්න ඕන ඒ නිසා කල් දාන්න ඕන ආයතන කල් දෙමින් තුලින් මේ බාගිනින් ටීම් එකට පුළුවන් you know the, that will get a sufficient time to study the matter and then hopefully the bargaining team will be able to develop a good you know dima good counter proposal a good plan for the dima that is good for the business okay so therefore usually then the top manager is not allowed to participate in uh, the bargaining table then fourth step that is legalization that is uh, legalization what is this niti gata kiri in singapore once the agreement is accepted by top management and union members then they have to sign both parties you now will have to sign then after signing you know it will become a formal document between the management and the trade union and that that has to be forwarded to the labor commissioner who will examine its content the purposes and all these that if the commission agrees with them the commissioner will you know publish it in the government gazette after publishing in the government gazette the collective bargaining will become a legal document legal document so once it is published in the gazette it will become a legitimate document that is binding on both parties both parties are supposed to adhere to each term of the agreement each condition of the agreement if broken then the relevant party is going to be punished okay legalization right so this is a uh, right special requirement uh, in sri lanka according to industrial disputes act industrial uh, disputes act in sri lanka right then the third stage uh, that is administrative stage hari parana adhya so what occurs in this stage is to make the agreement effective now right. at the at the preparatory stage the management you know got prepared about bargaining about bargaining at the second stage the management and the trade union got together and then discussed engage in bargaining actually resulting in an agreement so now at the third stage this agreement needs to be implemented needs to be effective so it means that controlling day to day functioning of both parties in accordance with the terms and conditions of the agreement okay there are certain steps which are three yes three uh, steps under this stage the first one of the third uh, stage is communication of the agreement communication of the agreement yusuma sanvedane kirim so contents of the agreement are to be communicated to all concerned within the organization ideally every worker should know about the agreement and its details ideally every manager should know the agreement and its details ideal okay ideal so without such extended communication it is not possible to expect that every organization members behavior complies with the agreement complies uh, with the agreement so especially the agreement needs to be communicated to line managers otherwise they may break they may take their own decisions with regard to various matters of managing their subordinates and then those you know various decisions be uh, destroyed the collective agreement break the collective agreement 
assume according to collective agreement, promotion should be given, promotion should be given by considering um, mainly the seniority, by considering mainly the seniority according to the agreement. If there's a line manager who considers merit instead of seniority and gives uh, promotions, that is against the collective agreement. Therefore, the relevant line manager should know that uh, promotion should be given mainly based on seniority. Okay. So, assume according to the agreement, there are 100 marks uh, when giving promotions, and then 50 marks have been allocated for merit, 50 marks have been allocated for the seniority. Okay, so then all the people, relevant people should know about. Then how to do, uh, you know, how to do this communication? Of course, through one day workshop, lectures, personal notifications, internal bulletins, and they can be used as modes of communication. Then uh, step two of the third stage, that is adjustment, Galapuma adjustment. Some changes will have to be made to policies, procedures, rules, regulations, methods, etc. You know, they are being currently followed by the organization. Because of what? Because of the decisions of the collective agreement. For example, assume uh, up to now, you know, currently uh, for grievance handling, the open door policy is being practiced for uh, grievance handling by the organization. But after the agreement, now the company is supposed to practice the formal grievance settlement procedure. Formal grievance settlement procedure. So therefore, the open door policy has to be abolished and then the formal uh, grievance settlement procedure has to be established. Has to be established. Okay, even the salary adjustments, new salary adjustments, new percentages, you know, came assume after the, the agreement. Uh, they, you know, so then all uh, percentages, all the all procedures for paying salaries, you know, will have to be changed. Right. Now, the third step of the third stage. Ensure union and management compliance. Urti samiti sa karmana karitya atara ikkagatya sati kargani. For what? For what? To follow the terms and conditions of the agreement. Not to violate any term and condition of the agreement. So that's the final step. Okay, so both union and management should work without violating the agreement. A major role, you know, has to be played by the HR department. Okay, so in this contest, the HR department will have to play a special role. It should be alert whether, you know, about whether something happens against the agreement. So if it happens so, summarily, you know, summarily, immediately, the HR department should take actions to stop it. Otherwise, you know, uh, it will give advice, suggestions, recommendations to the relevant manager you know, to take actions to stop it. Or otherwise, you know, it should give advice, suggestions, recommendations to the relevant managers. Okay, all right. By detailing the process of collective bargaining is over now. I hope you understood the process. Okay.
now shall we go to next sub topic the final sub topic yes joint consultation ekabaddha vicharan in singular ekabaddha vicharan joint consultation this is not collective bargaining this is different from collective bargaining but this is also useful strategy you know for 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 having cordial sound labor management relationship sound labor relation what is this workers participation in making decisions you know joint consultation you know involves workers participation getting workers participation so normally normally you know that management is done by manager the managers make decision about various aspects of the organization including aspect of managing people at work that is a charge there is a charge usually the charge and decision are made by manager made by managers but because of uh, industrial democracy because of uh, the need of having industrial peace industrial peace the concept you know workers participation ke seva daayak sahabhagitva sevak sahabhagitva that's why trade union ke the trade union trade union involvement the trade union involvement so therefore normally the terms and conditions of the employment should be favorable to the workers if they are favorable to only the employer that is not fair that is not fair so a simple example you know a uh, number of hours of working per day number of hours of working per day Okay, so the decision to okay, what is the decision with regard to that number of hours of work? Assume this is an issue. Number of hours to be worked per day. This has to be set. This has to be set. assume there is no workers participation then this is decided by the employer assume employer is corrupted employer is money hungry a uh, profit hungry uh, then the employee tends to exploit the labor then per day the employee prefers as you the employee prefers 10 days sorry 10 hours not days eh? 10 hours per day rasul this is unfair this is unfair because the employee has a personal life the employee has other life source assume the it is fair to have 8 hours per day 8 hours per day if there is no workers participation are then it is possible to have 10 hours so which will really become inconvenient harmful to the workers workers assume workers prefers you know workers prefer a worker prefers or workers prefer to have assume a uh, six day not six days no six hours six hours to work per day because they want to enjoy it you know they want to enjoy the the rest of the hours they can use for enjoyment their personal life and this is also assume unfair if we think of the survival of the business meeting the demands of the customers productivity assume working for 6 hours per day is not sufficient not sufficient so this is good for the so this is good for the workers but bad for the employee Okay, this one working ten hours per day is good for the employer, 
but bad for the employees. Then a fair decision is assume eight hours. So that's the fair decision. Okay. So that's why, you know, in order to get fair decisions like this, there must be a balance with regard to the, uh, I mean, between the power of the trade union and also the power of the uh, management, the employer. Okay, so therefore, that's why, you know, there's a need of uh, workers participating in a simple example to show the uh, need of uh, workers' participation. Right, workers' participation in making decisions that affect workers' jobs and their lives has been a workers' right in many countries, especially in developed countries like UK, Germany, and US. Even in, in Japan, yes, this is possible, this is popular. But this phenomenon is not seen in many environments in our country that I have to say. So it is possible to mention here that the joint consultation in the developed world is becoming more popular and more important between employers' representatives and workers' representatives. The joint cons consultation can happen in an organization which is unionized, also can happen in an organization which is not unionized. So it doesn't mean that, uh, you know, it means that there's essentially, I mean, to, I mean, we, we have to have trade unions to implement joint consultation. No, without trade unions also, we can do joint consultation. But remember, without trade unions, we can't do collective bargaining. And reaching a collective agreement, it is not possible to do without trade unions. But here, doing consultation without trade unions, we can do that. With trade unions, we can do that. Right, what is a joint consultation? That refers to an activity of obtaining workers' ideas and comments before making decisions that affect them. Here, yeah, them means workers. So before taking decisions, which affect workers, such as you know, promotions, transfers, layoff, terminations, retirements, days of leave, you know, uh, times of working, so etc. So before deciding such decisions, which affect workers, joint consultation involves obtaining workers' ideas and comments whether they like or not, you know. So normally the decisions, you know, tentative decisions, you know, temporary decisions are made by the management, by the relevant management. Then they are presented to workers in order to get their ideas and comments. If they don't like, if they like, they can present. They can present. Okay, so then if the management takes decisions affecting jobs and their lives, it may be that those decisions are not welcome yet by workers or cannot be implemented successfully, you know, if they are forcing, so like this. these things you can understand, please. Right. Uh, okay, so, you know, some, some reasons, you know, for, for, for the need of getting workers' ideas and comments. You know, if you get workers' ideas and comments, then they will be happy. They will understand that they are important. The management, you know, really uh, considers them as important. That's why the management gets ideas and suggestions from workers. Then, you know, there will be a positive attitude within workers about the management. So, like, the, you know, in that way we can analyze, uh, right. Then joint consultation is a genuine cooperative attempt or method for solving problems which are important to both employees and employers. So therefore following elements are essential for successful joint consultation. Because under joint consultation, 
you know the management is going to get ideas comments even proposals you know uh, about decisions with regard to certain issues the management is going to get from work for that you know one thing is the management acceptance then the, every relevant manager must accept that getting comments and ideas from workers before making decisions affecting them is a worker's right that is a worker's right so then every manager especially the top managers should accept that if top managers should not accept this what is this getting comments and ideas from workers before making decisions affect them is a worker's right if there are top managers who do not accept this worker's right of course it is not possible to implement job cons you know joint consultation joint consultation the management acceptance of that workers can give a significant contribution to the vision making and value of that organization especially top managers or the top managers okay so especially the top managers should think that the workers you know are capable they also can give a significant contribution to decision making and value of that organization they also know problems they also know possible solutions they are also experienced they are also educated so like that that acceptance should be there for successful implementation of joint consultation the management willingness to listen to workers suggestions and criticism so normally there are many, you know normally managers do not like to look, listen to workers suggestions and criticism because they think that they are more educated more experienced they are more important they know how to manage normally workers were not managers who don't have managers management education management experience they don't know how to make decisions they don't know how to give good suggestions and criticism So normally managers think like that. So that you know, thinking has to be changed. So therefore, manage managers, you know, must have the right willingness, the willingness to listen. They are subordinates. Then workers' acceptance also another thing. Expertise of management. The workers should accept that you know, the expertise of management. The managers. There are managers who are expert in management. For example, a chart. worker should understand that hr manager assume is a real expert in hr so therefore workers should accept that workers you know should should understand that they might be or may be able to make some comments with regard to hr decisions but they don't know how to you know really make right hr decisions how to really develop policies procedures and rules of hr m you know, to develop policies procedures The rules of HR, you know, there must be a real expertise in HR. Workers should understand that, should accept that. Okay, right. Working together by both parties, indeed, that should be the readiness of one party to consider opinions and objectives of the other party. Then communication of what is happening and what has happened under the joint consultation to all workers and managers. Open communication. extensive communication without hiding certain you know details right okay then uh, for the purpose of uh, implementation of joint consultation with the organization it is you know there's a need of appointing a committee you know there's a need You know, for appointing a committee or to appoint a committee, uh, that committee will consist of representatives from workers and also representatives from management. Two or three managers, two or three workers, or maybe uh, five managers representing five sections of the five departments of the organization, and then maybe fifteen workers representing all the, you know. sections of the organization and in case of a large organization 
there may be several committees you know at the unit level department level and the organizational level so right so remember that you know the, the, these you know these committees you know the joint consultation committee you know, the representatives for a joint consultation committee the representative from workers are not you know necessarily trade union people you know, in a situation where it is unionized assume you know we consider an organization which is unionized and then uh, then there is collective bargaining also and joint consultation also don't think that you know for the joint consultation the representative from workers should be the leaders of the union. Maybe may not be. Maybe may not be. You know, there can be representatives from workers who are not the members of. Oh, sorry, who are not even yes, who may be not, who may not be the members of the union, or assume they are members of the union, but they may not be the leaders of the union. That is possible. Okay, right. Then, uh, what is the difference between, or what are the differences between collective bargaining and joint consultation? Right. Look at this one. The objective of collective bargaining. By objective, you know, we can differentiate between collective bargaining and joint consultation. The objective of collective bargaining is to achieve a collective agreement that is specifies terms and conditions of employment, yes, for a period of, for a particular period of time. But look at the objective of joint consultation. It is to get ideas, objections, suggestions and advice from workers by management before making decisions. Right? Before making decisions, affecting workers in order to ensure industrial peace, yes. In order to avoid industrial unrest. So therefore the object, you know, the objective of joint consultation is to get ideas, suggestions from the workers before making decisions affecting them. But the objective of collective agreement is, sorry, collective bargaining is to Achieve a collective agreement. Now, not getting ideas and all, to achieve a collective agreement that will really regulate the behavior of the trade union and the behavior of the managers for a period of at least three years. Then, what is the result of successful collective bargaining? The result of successful collective bargaining. It is the creation of a collective agreement. There has to be honored, there has to be followed by both parties. But what is the result of successful joint consultation? That's the creation of a collection of information. For the purpose of making decisions, not really a collection of decisions, you know, collection of information. For the purpose of making decisions which are more acceptable and easier to implement. Decisions are made by the management. Final decisions are made by the management, not by the workers. But before making final decisions by the management, under joint consultation, collecting information from workers is there. Okay? Right. And under collective agreement, both will take a decision jointly over an issue. However, on the joint consultation, final decision of an issue is made by the manager. Okay, all right. <clears throat> okay, now uh, let us go to the case. The title of the case is Water Machines Company. Uh, Mr. Jayasena was very worried about the deteriorating labor management relations of water machines company. 
water machines factory in Sri Lanka. Water machines factory in Sri Lanka. So deteriorating labor management relations. That means decline, becoming labor management relationship unfavorable. His father founded the firm in 1977. Since the owners lived in apartments over the factory, Mr. Jaisin had been acquainted, associated, you know, acquainted with the business from childhood. He had studied sciences and was interested in mechanical and technological innovations. He had worked on almost all of the machines in the factory and was thoroughly familiar with all of the technical processes employed. Okay, so he had worked on almost all the machines in the factory and was, you know, uh, able to get a thorough, complete, full, you know, familiarity with all of the technical processes employed in the company. Mr. Jaisena began working in the factory in 1970 when he was 20, when he was 20. So in order to keep with developments in the water machines industry, he went to Europe after having been working in the factory for six years. While in Europe, he had visited many factories and worked in a number of them. At the British Agricultural Development Department, he learned a great deal about the science of water machine and technology of making high power water machines. Whenever he came across a method or device which could improve efficiency and productivity, he sent a detailed description of it to the factory in Sri Lanka. So most of these innovations were adopted immediately and proven highly successful. So therefore, you know, after learning new things, you know, this person was used to send the details of, you know, uh, those new developments, you know, by asking them uh, to be installed, to be implemented. So then most of these innovations were implemented and then uh, became successful, highly successful. Mr. Jaisena returned from Europe with ideas of some tool making machines, which were not available in Sri Lanka, you know, at that time. So this case was based on uh, an actual situation, certain uh, things, you know, I mean, certain details have been disguised, but, uh, you know, uh, certain uh, details are actual. Uh, anyway, you know, whether the case is an actual one or not, you know, is not that important for the learning purpose and for the teaching purpose. So you are supposed to learn uh, certain certain things from this case, especially supposed to get a practical oriented understanding, practical oriented understanding. Yeah, because this is online setting, in the usual setting, you know, normally uh, you, you have to do this one. You have to read this case seriously, at least three times, and then you know, uh, in a group uh, way, in a group way. Uh, it is possible to make presentations and then uh, do uh, criticism, comments. You know, one, uh, one group of uh, students you know, can present, another group of students can observe, uh, another group of students can uh, make comments about the presentations. You know, a case sets out a problem. Case, you know, sets out a problem, at least one problem. So normally, a case gives several uh, problems which need to be settled, which need to be solved. Okay, so because of the time limitation, you know, I'm not going to talk about the theory of case and case uh, settlement. Okay, then uh, Mr. Jaisena returned from Europe with ideas of some tool making machines which are not available in Sri Lanka. So he used this to develop more labor saving equipment. He introduced many ideas to the factory and remarkably improved both efficiency and productivity. This development saved the company considerab considerably. You know, 
uh, in, a, in a material way, consider consider probably salaki to lesser. Again, Mr. Jinasay Namuna Dunu Noikudu Alut Kremanisa Ayatane Karakshamatare Nishpadakat Productivity Veduna Nisa me Menisa Salaki to lesser, Mudaliti Karaganimata Ayatane Puluan. Mr. Jayasena believed that the owner should be friendly and sympathetic with the factory workers. Friendly and sympathetic with the factory workers. He dressed in simple clothes and arrived at the factory punctually every morning. Going everywhere in the factory, he freely helped workers to solve technical difficulties and often worked machines himself. Sometimes he trained workers on new machines. In addition to giving advice about personal and family problems, Mr. Jinasena gave money to needy workers and visited them when they were sick. When they were sick. So therefore, Mr. Jinasena was you know, friendly with the factory workers, also sympathetic with the factory workers. When they were needed, Mr. Jinasena was Mr. Jaisen, Mr. Jaisen uh, was, uh, you know, helpful whenever needed. The Mr. Jaisen gave even the money to needy workers. Visited them, you know, when they were sick, when they were sick. Right. Mr. Jaisen believed in that he should live, he should lead a simple life. In order to satisfy the worker's idea, he thought of getting married. You know, two personal decisions, or the thought of getting married to a girl sharing such a way. He thought that the sight of ladies dressed in fine clothes and jewelry, riding in expensive cars, might make workers more aware of their poverty. In July 1999, workers at the company were were behaving boisterously, that means aggressively, and were making demands which Mr. Jayasena thought were unreasonable. Mr. Jayasena thought the wages in the factory were very reasonable and the bonuses paid were adequate. The company followed an open door policy for grievance handling. Open door policy for grievance handling. As a result of signs of this unfavorable condition, Mr. Jayasena decided to have a meeting with company accountant and marketing manager. I don't think we need to be, we need to worry about a union. Our company pays good wages and has a sound bonus program, said the accountant. Sure, our pay and bonuses are fair, but a union could promise our workers even more. Besides, workers don't always join unions for higher pay or bonuses. They may want a union as a protest of company policies or simply because they feel being unfairly treated. Marketing manager commented. Okay, thus marketing manager commented. Well, if any supervisor is treating workers unfairly, they can tell me, I will take action quickly. Since management at this factory takes care of workers, I don't think workers should want to join a union. If they do, we should try to stop it before it gets out of hand. The owner added with little thought. Also, he said thus, I am certain that the union leaders are stirring, you know, provoking, provoking, stirring up resentment against injustice, which does not really exist. Several times I noticed union leaders of Sri Lanka Workers Union around the factory. I believed in that. The leader of the Sri Lankan Workers Union is trying to make money because he is unable to earn a living in the low profession for which he was trained. The meeting ended without any action or strategy 
for improving LMR, labor management relationship. In October 1999, the union officials promised workers higher wages and bonuses if they would join the union. They told the workers that the, the owners had been exploiting them, Surakana, exploiting them. By the end of the year, 107 workers out of 204 workers working for the company joined the union and established a branch in the company. So therefore, dear students, you, know, you are supposed to read at least three times. This is a case, to a certain extent, a comprehensive case. Therefore, reading you know, this case for one time is not sufficient for right uh, study. For right studying, you are supposed to read at least uh, three times this case. So you have to understand what are the characters or the people involved in the case. And also, you have to understand where is this, you know, uh, you know, what is the company, you know, relevant to this case? What does company do? So you have to understand. Okay, so this is a motor, you know, uh, this is a company which produces uh, water machines, not water machines, water machines. Okay, water machines company, right. Okay, then what are the questions? The first question, identify and mention the factors which have contributed to the decision of workers to unionize. Identify uh, and mention the factors uh, which have contributed to the decision of workers to unionize. So, so what are the factors, you know, which have contributed to the decision of workers to unionize? What is this? This is a figure, you know, this is a figure. A model of unionization. This is a general model that shows, you know, how uh, workers join a union. This was uh, discussed during the first lecture on the topic labor relations, labor re relations inefficient, prejudiced, weak management and other states. So in simple bad management. So because of bad management, the worker becomes dissatisfied with the job. Then that person individually attempts to solve his or her problems. His or her problems. Now this individual attempt may be successful, may be unsuccessful. If it is successful, then no problem, the employee becomes satisfied. But if the individual attempt to solve problems got unsuccessful, then again, uh, pay uh, job dissatisfaction. Now it may, it may be, you know, the problem may be about pay, maybe about promotions, maybe about leave, maybe about transfers. You know? So therefore the unsuccessful, you know, uh, individual attempt will, 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 will result in increasing the degree of jobs dissatisfaction. Then the employee, you know, will understand that the employee cannot solve his or her problems individually. The employee will understand the importance of trade union as a vehicle of solving his or her problems. Uh, that is called union instrumentality. Union instrumentality. So then if the employee understand that benefits of joining the union exceed the cost of the cost of joining the union, 
then the employee decides to join the union. This is how unionization happens according to this theory. I'm not going to detail again. So this was detailed at the first session on labor relations. I think you can remember. If you can't remember, please go to the relevant learning materials and then study. Also, I mentioned, you know, there are two factors which determine the, whether the individual attempt is going to be successful or not. You know, usually the employee uh, engages in an individual attempt to solve his or her problems. This individual attempt may be successful or unsuccessful. So that depends on two factors, job exclusivity and job essentiality which were discussed in the classroom. Okay, so therefore, this is a general theory that can be used by you, you know, to give a good answer for this question. Identify and mention the factors which have contributed to the decision of workers to union action. In addition to this uh, general theory, now you can present these things also as uh, factors which have contributed to unionization. One thing is this one. Mr. Jinasena, Mr. Jayasena, sorry. Mr. Jayasena, Mr. Jayasena introduced many ideas to the factory and remarkably improved both efficiency and productivity. Mr. Jayasena, Jayasena introduced many ideas to the factory and remarkably improved both efficiency and productivity. So these developments saved the company considerably. So according to the case, so that this was there. And however, these savings had not been shared. The savings, you know, had not been shared with, you know, shared between workers and the owner. So it seems that the owner uh, utilized the savings without you know, uh, giving a certain part of that saving to the workers who must have directly or indirectly contributed to the success of the business. It was possible to develop a bad attitude among at least some workers about the owner management because of this. That is one reason which has contributed to unionization of workers. Then influence of the lawyer. Yes, that is another reason. Influence of the lawyer. Certain workers believed in statements, arguments, explanations given by the lawyer so as to unionize. It was about exploitation exploitation of the labor. It may be that Mr. Jayasena has not purposefully exploited the labor, but the trade union, you know, these, the, 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 the lawyer and you know, the other people you know, who worked uh, to initiate the forming of the trade union in this organization must have uh, persuaded the workers to believe in that they were being exploited. That's why they, you know, uh, decided to join the union. So likewise, you know, you can give factors, you know, which have contributed to the decision of workers to unionize. So at the first session, at the first session, you must have learned, uh, you know, some other factors some other factors uh, of uh, unionization. Can you remember them? Can you remember, you know, certain factors? So I think I taught you uh, certain factors given by Professor, the Harvard Professor of Industrial Relations, Professor Mills. One reason 
in opposition to manage the unfair. Another reason to participate in union activities. Another reason to exercise leadership. Another reason, uh, it is because of social pressure. Another reason, compulsory unionism. So I told you at the first session on labor relations, uh, compulsory unionism is not applicable to Sri Lanka. So in Sri Lanka, there is no mandatory requirement for the worker to join a union. But anyway, social pressure is a valid reason. There may be workers you know, who join the union. Assume you are an employee who has not yet joined, but these friends or other workers may influence, persuade you to become a member of the union. Otherwise, they may tell you, you know, they are going to uh, I mean, not consider you as a peer to them, or as a friend to them, as an associate to them. They may even threaten that, you know, if you don't join, then we don't talk to you. We don't uh, exchange the relevant information with you. So likewise, you know, so these are you know, reasons uh, which may contribute to the decision of workers to unionize. So therefore, by using them also, you must be able to develop a rich answer for this question. Okay, now the second question, examine and comment Mr. Jayasena's uh, perception of LMR. Mr. Jayasena's perception of LMR being faced by the company. Jayasena's, in, in, in brief, you know, Jayasena's perception of LMR is narrow. Indeed, you know, he understands uh, labor relations as personal relations, as personal relations, you know, as, uh, you know, so his understanding is narrow. Personal relations instead of labor relations. So I taught you about the difference between labor relations and individual and uh, personal relations. Alternatively, for personal relations, it is called as employee relations. Employee relations. So under employee relations, interactions happen individually between the manager and a certain employee. Who has a problem to be settled. You know, if you are an employee, if you have a problem uh, about the promotion, about the transfer, about the salary increment, then you can present your problem to your immediate superior or human resource manager. Your intention is to get a solution for that, favorable solution for that. Then you and the manager will interact individually. Uh, that interaction comes from the personal relations. But on the labor relations, collective relations, there are trade unions. There are trade unions. So trade unions, you know, will deal with the management in order to solve problems. Now those collective relations come under labor relations. So therefore, uh, Mr. Jayasena's perception is narrow, not broad. So he pursued uh, personal relations instead of labor relations. He believed that uh, personally dealing with employees is enough. He believed only in that. But he, he couldn't understand that there is something called labor relations. Trade unions are there. Trade unions are formed uh, owing to several reasons, which I mentioned previously, relating to the first question. But they were not, it seems that they were not known by this honor manager, by this honor manager. You know, he, <clears throat> he believed that the owner should be friendly and sympathetic with the factory workers. This is okay. Then he dressed in simple clothes 
and arrive at the factory punctually every morning. So, what's this? You know, what is the intention behind this? But that is questionable. We have to question. Going everywhere in the factory really help workers to solve technical difficulties. This is okay. But when the organization becomes larger and larger, more complex, uh, this style, leadership style is not good. Because, you know, uh, you, know, you must have heard about a concept called management by exception. Vyatri Reiki Anu Kalamanakar. The top manager, you know, uh, should save his time, his effort, you know, in order to deal with more important issues like strategic management, dealing with the industry, dealing with outside things. For that, you know, there's a serious need of saving time and energy rather than dealing with, you know, day-to-day -day, uh, things. To deal with day-to-day -day things, you know, the authority, the renowned authority has to be delegated to the uh, down managers, the respective manager. Who will do that? The owner is the top manager of the organization. Maybe that is good, you know, if the situation is small. The company has been developing, has been developing. We have often work uh, the machines himself. You know, sometimes they train workers on new machines. That is good. But, uh, you know, uh, training workers on new machines takes a lot of time, a lot of energy from the top manager. Why not, you know, appointing a human resource manager to do training and other relevant things with regard to managing people at work? In this case, it doesn't seem that there's a manager called human resource manager. It seems that there's no department, so-called HR department, led by the so-called human resource manager. Most of the human resource things, it seems that are being handled by this owner manager. When the situation is small, it is okay. But the, when the organization is becoming more and more complex, it is not good. Human resource issues become more complex, which require, you know, uh, certain technical competence in a child. In addition to that, uh, competence or understanding of labor laws. If they are missing from the owner manager, then most likely the HR decisions are going to be not sound. So in addition to giving advice about personal and family problems, Mr. Jackson gave money to needy workers and visited them when they were sick. You know, this is also dangerous normally. Assume those workers, you know, who were who were perceived by Jinasena not as needy workers, then they were not given money. Those workers, you know, may think that uh, an injustice was done to them. Perhaps there may be workers, you know. Uh, who did not reveal their personal problem, then they could not get money. But by seeing, you know, some other workers, you know, who were given by Dinasena with some money, uh, these workers who were not, may misunderstand. Rather than, you know, uh, uh, personal dealings like this, it is good to develop a system of welfare, welfare administration, welfare management, which is a function of HRM. Because of this corona situation and our time limitation, uh, that topic, uh, we could do that. Uh, labor related, what is this? Uh, welfare administration. No, it, it is better to, you know, develop certain welfare facilities. And then professionally, those facilities, you know, can be managed by using right policies, procedures, and rules. So that is always better than, you know, personal dealings.
Mr. Jai Sena believed in that he should lead a simple life in order to satisfy workers' idea. This is not acceptable, you know. One should not live a simple life in order to satisfy the ideal of others. So I assume thing, Jai said, are you going to lead a simple life in order to satisfy you know, the ideal of others? Most like, you know, I mean, it is not a good belief. You know, if you believe in a simple life, then in order to satisfy your idea, you should lead that simple life. This may be interpreted as cheating, you know, as cheating. Then he thought of getting married to a girl sharing such a view. Perhaps the girl, you know, doesn't have, you know, such a view. I mean, the, the, the woman, he thought that the sight of ladies dressed in fine clothes and jewelry and riding in expensive cars might make workers more aware of their power. Examine, you know, peruse this, uh, this sentence seriously. Onim pariksha kala balan me vaki. Again, a boma, you know, expensive, you know, Vedan adika supo bogi vahano la gaman kiri. Yavagema adima adum paladum swarna burna paladagina city, my ladies. The eva eva dekimi workers la terena ego la guda dupati. So he thought that. So therefore, definitely, it's, it's most likely that, you know, or we can infer, you know, he must have uh, persuaded his wife not to wear fine clothes and jewelry, and also not, not to go in expensive car. Who knows that she's unhappy? Who knows that, you know, she wanted to, you know, wear fine clothes and jewelry but because of his you know idea of leading a simple life and also because of his thought there is this you know, you know because of his intention not to make workers more aware of their power he must have persuaded his wife not to do these things more likely that the his wife also is not happy if you know wife really wanted to you know dress fine clothes and wear you know expensive jewelries and you know wanted to have riding in expensive cars so therefore genuinely this means that workers are poor they are in poverty so then this man is you know uh, this man knows that workers are poor. So if the man is genuine and genuinely interested in well-being of the workers, he should not do this one. In fact, you know, instead, you know, he could have, okay, he could have, you know, he could have, <clears throat> I mean, led a kind of, you know, moderate life. At least moderate life, he would have led a moderate life instead of a simple life, also instead of a very luxurious life. Moderate life, and then while leading a moderate life, you know, he could have helped, he could have started certain welfare programs to, 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 to you know, help workers. To reduce their poverty. Right. Okay, then, uh, so likewise, you know, right. Think and then, you know, uh, okay, then, uh, third question. Evaluate the policy of grievance handling being applied by the company. Suggest an appropriate policy and procedure of grievance handling for the company. So what is the grievance handling 
policy or method being followed by this company. Okay, go to this paragraph in the last sentence. From this, you can find the method. The company followed an open door policy for grievance handling. Then you have to discuss, you know, uh, disadvantages of open door policy. So this type of policy, you know, so what do you mean by open door policy? Any grievance, you know, with his or her problem, you now he's allowed to meet the chief executive officer of the organization. Here in this case, Mr. Jaisi. Then any grievance, uh, any employee with the grievance can present his or her grievance to Mr. Jaisi. His, you know, I mean, the, the door of his room is open to anyone. Anyone. That's the meaning of open door policy. But when the organization is getting bigger and bigger, this policy, uh, you know, is, you know, is, I mean, the soundness of the policy is going down. Appropriateness of the policy is going down. You must have learned about uh, certain methods of grievance handling, open door policy, ombudsman, quasi method, counseling, counseling. Uh, formal grievance settlement proceeding, formal grievance settlement uh, proceeding. Okay, so then you must have learned that the best method out of those methods for grievance handling is formal grievance settlement pros uh, proceeding. In some cases, it may be a combination of formal grievance settlement procedure and grievance committee consisting of uh, several right uh, managers. Okay, so uh, the policy of grievance handling, then you, know, you can suggest the program like this. This is an example of the sound grievance settlement procedure. An example of similarly Nature was taught at the first session on labor relations to you. Okay, there are certain steps. And as the first step, the grievant and the immediate superior. The grievant presents the grievance to the immediate superior, who is supposed to find a solution within 24 hours. If the immediate superior cannot, then with his solar comments, the grievance is forwarded to the next level. Where the immediate superior superior attempts to settle the grievance. The time limitation is two days. Within two days, the immediate superior superior should give a solution to the grievance. Assume the immediate superior superior also has no settlement. And then it goes to the human resource manager, this level between human resource manager and the trade union representative. Within four, four days, an answer is expected. Assume at this level also, there's no solution for the grievance. It may be a promotion. It may be a new transfer. No? Right. Okay, then uh, the highest level, according to this example, an attempt is made between the trade union leader and general manager to make a settlement for the grievance within seven days. Even at this level, if there is no settlement, then it goes to arbitration where an independent arbitrator participates in making a solution, in giving an award, arbitration award, of course, which is binding, uh, to you know, by the to the both parties. Okay, so this is an example of a formal grievance settlement procedure that can suggest for this company.
it is good, you know, because the how many workers now here? The, there are 204 workers now. Right. Then, uh, fourth question. Assume that the company has to reach a collective agreement with the union. If the CEO consults you, what advice do you give him with respect to preparation for bargaining, negotiation for, bar, for an argument, sorry, for an agreement, and administration of that agreement or the agreement? So can you remember the model, model of collective bargaining that I presented you? So if you have a good knowledge about the model, by using the model, you can prepare a good answer, a better answer for this question. The purpose of this question is to test your knowledge about that theory, about that particular model of collective bargaining. There are three stages, preparatory stage, Can you remember uh, three stages? Okay, this is the right here. We got okay. This uh, no, I don't have that figure here, but uh, you know I presented. So you can remember. So then, according to the figure, there are uh, three stages. Yes, there are three stages. The first one, preparatory stage. Second one. Negotiation stage, third one, administration stage. Preparatory stage has seven, seven steps. Can you remember? Assemble the bargaining team, monitor the environment, then determine time or determine offers. Yes, determine offers, counterproductive, sorry, uh, counter proposals, not counterproductive, okay, counter proposals for the likely union demands, for the demands presented by the trade union. So likewise, you know, seven steps on the preparatory stage. Then four steps on the negotiation stage, which include discussion, reach an agreement, approve the agreement, and legalization. Then third stage is administration stage. There are three steps, communication of the agreement, adjustment, and ensure union and management uh, compliance. Okay, so then, right. So therefore, based on the model, you can prepare your course of consultation to the CEO, Mr. Jai Say. Right, then question five. Question five. Assume that The trade union enters a collective agreement. Collective agreement with the management which provides for a 20% wage increase and the management decides to grant this benefit only to 107 workers who are members of the union. Do you agree with the decision or not? Why? Okay, so I assume you know there was a collective bargaining that resulted in a collective agreement according to which a 20% wage increase has been decided to you know, grant uh, only to 107 workers who are members of the union. How many workers? You know, presently working, 204 workers. Out of 204 workers, 107 workers join the union. Join the union. Not all workers. Only 107 workers. Right. So, do you agree with this? Of course, you know, uh, uh, you should not agree with. Not agree with not agree with. Why? Why? Several valid reasons can be given. One reason is this. 
according to Sri Lankan labor law, you know, a privilege or a benefit, you know, like this, the 20% wage increase, you know, cannot be given to only a category of employees. If there is a privilege like this, or if there is an advantage like this, or if there is simply, if there is a 20% wage increase, that has to be paid to all workers, 200 and, how many, 204 workers. Yes, 204 workers. Not only, you know, to 107 workers who became members, the other workers also should be paid. Otherwise, it is illegal. However, however, a 20, percent wage increase, you know, to pay a 20% wage increase only to 107 workers you know, is legal if there is a categorical special mention in the collective agreement specifying that privileges or increases of this nature are applicable to or given to only members of the trade union. If it is there, then it is possible. Otherwise, it is illegal. Another reason, you know, another valid reason, what I call is a valid managerial reason. So if you, you know, if you give a 20% wage increase only to 107 workers who are members of the union, you are really uh, treating unfairly workers who have not yet joined the trade union. Why did they not you know, join the union? Because they were loyal to Mr. Uh, no, Jai Singh. They were, they were, because they were loyal to Mr. Jai Singh, they did not join. They did not join the union. So then, you know, you are going to penalize people, you know, or workers who had been loyal to you. No, I mean, you mean the CEO, CEO. Then another reason is, so if this wage increase is given to only 107 workers who are members of the union, most likely that will lead to other workers to join the union. You know, then after joining, they also will be able to get this 20% wage increase. Okay, all right. Then question six. Question six. LMR should be cordial, or at least there should be no tension in the relations for the well being of all concerned owners, managers, and workers. Describe briefly four strategies that can be followed by the company for good LMR. Okay, these are some, you know, strategies. Four strategies, right? Joint consultation, formal grievance settlement procedure, information sharing, good policy and procedure for collective bargaining. Okay, so to a certain extent, then I analyzed the case by myself and gave the answers for the questions. But of course, you are supposed to, you know, understand the case. And even you can improve the answers that I discussed, the answers that I gave. There may be good answers, may not be, you know, better answers. So that means, you know, what I mean is there are, you know, possibilities of improving the answers that I gave. That is the nature of, you know, solving a case. There are no, you know, hard answers which are right for a case. You know, that is, you know, going to be true for every time. 
Then the time passes, uh, there may be new, new improvements and a chat. New, I mean, better LMR uh, principles, concepts, procedures. Okay, then. Let me show. Let me do another exercise. Have a serious look at this figure. What are you seeing? What are you noticing? There is an employee here. It seems that who is in pain, Vedana in pain about pain. Look at his face. Then there's another employee. No. Seems to be tired, exhausted. Most likely because of working. Look at his face. Not showing happiness, showing unhappiness. Then the middle man, who is this? Most likely the supervisor or the boss. Commanding, giving an order to this person. Regarding what? If you look at this one. Second, second scenario. The same situation, right? The second picture. You can see, you know, there is a there is a small bit straight. which is being carried out by two people. Then this person seems to be happy because he is understanding that is the order of bringing something like this. He is being carried out by these two people. Then this employee is having an expectation, looking at them, you know, who are approaching to us. The person, now third picture, what can you see, what can you notice? It seems that, uh, you know, this machine got broken, then a certain part, you know, the boss is keeping here. Of course, for the purpose of repairing. Look at the man who was in pain. The degree of pain must be high enough. Physically first, then mentally. Mentally why? By knowing that, you know, by knowing that he is not being treated. He is not being concerned. The, 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 the supervisor or the boss is not showing any concern of this man's pain. The supervisor is showing a concern of the work, of the uh, instrument, or equipment, not considering the employee who was in pain, who is now, of course, who is in pain, no concern for the person. But concern for the work or the, the instrument. Look at faces of these uh, two workers. Seems to be, you know, seems, uh, it seems that the person is having a kind of frustration, maybe anger, anger. Bad attitude, you know is now generating within these two people about the boss because of the fact that the painful employee, the hurt employee, I mean the person who got hurting, the pain, to be wounded, is being now ignored. The last picture of the uh, situation the boss seems to be happy, indicating that the work is over. 
the problem is stores uh, i mean the problem has been set then this person is having, having a question what are your boss is concerned with the work and the equipment not concerned with the employee so if you know the situation is like this it leads to dissatisfaction of workers if there is no trade union situations of this nature may lead to form trade unions lmr is going to be bad if there is a trade union then these people you know may make a complaint to the trade union leader who will bring the matter to the attention of the top people that is about unfair treatment given to the workers no concern given to the workers if there is no trade union are then bad employee relations okay all right now uh, this is the end of the second session on the topic labor relations